but it is now 10 o'clock, so uh, we got Connor McGar up. Uh, he does some exploit dev and vulnerability research at CrowdStrike. Rocks a real solid blog, too, so go check it out. I was peeping that just a little bit ago. Without any further ado, take it away, Connor. Hello, test, test, okay. Yeah. Sorry, technology's hard, everybody. Um, so, thanks for having me here. This is actually my first time speaking at a B-Size in person. Um, so, don't crucify me too hard if uh, it's not up to the standards. Um, but basically, just wanted to say thanks for having me here in uh, Kansas City and a uh, big thanks to all of the sponsors from this year. Um, but with that, we'll go ahead and get into it. Um, so this talk is Exploit Development is Dead, Long Live Exploit Development. Um, so basically, I just wanted to talk about something which I'm passionate about, um, vulnerability research and binary exploitation. Um, so probably everyone in this room has heard of what this is, but you may not deal with it um, on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, so because of that, I thought it'd be interesting to take a look at some of the origins of exploit development and as well as um, some of the mitigations that modern operating systems have instrumented over time. Um, so, my name is Connor Magar. Uh, I'm a red team consultant at CrowdStrike, and so I find myself, you know, doing more red team pen testing, Windows Active Directory environment type engagements. Um, but in my free time, I like to um, obviously study vulnerability research. Um, I like to write, so anything I do that I find interesting um, or anything of that nature, I post on my blog. Um, and as well as outside of InfoSec, um, I like to study history and uh, spend time with family. Um, so we'll start off by talking about um, giving some context of what we mean by exploit development, and then uh, we'll get into some of the exploit mitigations um, that we have today. Um, and then third on the agenda is using a case study in a recent privilege uh, escalation vulnerability uh, in a well-known BIOS driver um, to basically outline how enabling a few mitigations which people may not be familiar with or maybe aren't enabled by default, how, how that can help thwart that type of exploitation. And then lastly, we'll talk about the practicality and future of binary exploitation. Um, so this is exploit development, the quick uh, rundown. So when we talk about exploit development, uh, mainly what we're talking about in context of this talk is binary exploitation or memory corruption. Um, so we're taking advantage of flaws in compiled code, basically, or binaries. Um, so Web vulnerabilities, etc., are their own classes on the vulnerable exploits, but in this case, we're talking more of memory corruption. Um, these are attractive because often they're point and shoot. So an adversary develops an exploit, run, they run it, and then they achieve their objective. Um, they're found in both user mode and kernel mode. Um, so typical user mode exploitation is used for initial access, and then as well, you have kernel mode for escalation of privileges. And these exploits basically get delivered through a variety of what are known as vulnerability classes, uh, which we'll speak on here in a second. Um, so as mentioned, these are used for initial access or privilege escalation or both. Um, so citing uh, two examples, um, Eternal Blue, um, I'm sure most everyone in this room has heard of that. That was an example of a remote kernel exploit, which basically could be used for initial access if the service is available. Um, and privilege escalation, and the same with um, SMB Ghost, a recent um, exploit in the SMB protocol. Um, and then kind of what this talk uh, outlines is exploit development now is not as trivial um, as it once was. So in the early days of binary exploitation, there's, or excuse me, of um, software development, there's not a lot of security in that uh, pipeline. So moving on, uh, going back to um, vulnerability classes, kind of now that we've set the stage, um, I'm sure most people have heard of these types of vulnerability classes before, but just to run down if you're not familiar. Um, buffer overflow, uh, basically you just have an ability to overwrite some adjacent memory. Um, use after free, which basically, um, are, these are very common with larger C++ applications. Uh, basically, um, if a developer is referencing some type of memory that was previously freed, um, this could cause issues and an attacker could leverage a few primitives in order to try to control that freed memory and do something within the application. Um, you have out-of-bounds reads, um, which are pretty self-explanatory. You can leak some type of sensitive information um, from adjacent memory. 
And then you have um, right, what, where vulnerabilities. Um, these are also called arbitrary rights. Um, so these are kind of twofold. These can be the result of another vulnerability class, um, or they can be a vulnerability class in and of itself. Um, basically, an adversary has a primitive to write some arbitrary memory to a controlled or otherwise uncontrolled location. Um, so those who aren't super familiar with binary exploitation, I just wanted to cite a quick example, which pretty much has been included in every um, exploit development talk ever given. Um, basically, this is um, a pseudo uh, stack, the um, stack data structure, where functions will uh, pass um, arguments, parameters, etc. Um, and then there's some kind of copy operation that writes some sort of memory to this stack location, and usually a, an adversary has a primitive to control the size and the data. Um, and so what that looks like after execution is um, an adversary can basically control this data structure, and since this data structure stores things like return addresses or um, addresses where an, uh, a program might redirect execution, it's possible for an adversary basically to um, control the control flow of the program and do some kind of malicious um, action executing code um, from this structure or other places in memory. So that's more trivial exploitation um, today. That's not really how things look for the most part. That's not to say that you can't find stack buffer overflows today, but um, most exploit chains consist of um, two components, a browser exploit. Um, obviously, everyone uses a browser, so this is a um, pretty viable target, um, and that's used for initial access because browsers today are sandboxed. Um, and then an adversary may um, uh, complement that with a kernel exploit in order to break out of that sandbox and escalate privileges um, on a machine. Um, and so basically adversaries have had to get creative um, because of exploit mitigation, which we'll talk about here shortly. Um, basically you have to chain multiple vulnerabilities together these days um, in order to achieve um, your objectives. So we'll kind of talk about what exploit mitigations are and um, their origins. So with exploit mitigations, there's kind of two roads that you can go down. Um, you can either make life impossible for an attacker, so basically uh, mitigating full vulnerability classes, um, or you can just make life a lot more harder um, in order to raise the cost um, for exploits. Um, so operating, operating systems implement these um, into the OS um, by default in a lot of cases, and they block certain vulnerability classes and exploitation techniques. And hopefully this talk kind of outlines what some of these mitigations are and, you know, um, give light to some you can enable to um, help protect yourself better. So we'll start with the uh, first vulnerability class, which um, people may be familiar with here, um, data execution prevention. Um, so as we showed in the previous um, uh, Stack Overflow example, um, an attacker relies on the fact they can control a segment of memory such as this in order to place their code and execute um, from that same region. Uh, well, with the dev enabled, basically now code are, there are boundaries between code and data segments of memory. So for an example, um, if an adversary can write their code to the stack portion of memory, well, that's a data portion of memory. Um, it doesn't really need to execute any actual uh, op codes. So basically that's not allowed uh, with dev enabled. And then the same thing with um, code segments, that's uh, the dot text section of a portable executable. Um, basically that's where you'll find your executable instructions. Um, and if you um, try to execute code in a data portion of memory, you'll get a status access violation as we've seen in the screenshot here. Um, there is kernel mode support um, for this, so in the Windows kernel um, used to the default pool uh, allocation, which basically is pretty synonymous with the heap um, in user mode, uh, they were executable and now that's no longer the case. And this is enforced by what's known as a page table entry bit, um, which we'll talk about in the future, but basically at a high level this is a memory address that points to some bits um, that enforce various permissions and properties of memory. So where there's a mitigation, there might most likely be a bypass. Um, so if you've ever heard of the term uh, code reuse or ROP, return oriented programming, um, this is kind of the era that we've been in and we're kind of um, staying in. Um, just because 
code reuse is like a, uh, a, a utility tool. It, it's very uh, malleable, and you can do a lot of different things with it. Um, so basically, when you have a data portion of memory, um, you can't execute code from there. So what do we do? We can look in an application or loaded modules within an application in order to reuse code um, that's already existing because that adheres to uh, DEP's uh, rules. And so basically an adversary looks through the uh, application and parses it for instructions and then takes those existing um, pointers basically and uses them in order to craft a function call or some kind of other action um, either to call something sensitive or to just mark the entire region of memory as read, write, and execute. Um, and two common uh, Windows exported functions that are used to do this are virtual protect, um, which we'll talk about here in a second, and write process memory. Um, so this may look confusing, but this is just a pseudo um, code reuse um, uh, technique. Um, so basically, as we talked about, if an adversary has control of the stack, which is normally what an adversary will try to do, um, they'll take those existing instructions and put those on the stack, um, and then natural program execution or some kind of control flow um, uh, hijacking will force the program to start executing these instructions from the stack. And so basically we can see um, the function on Windows Virtual Protect. Uh, this can basically change the permissions of a given page or region of memory. And so an attacker basically will um, craft a function call at the assembly level um, using code reuse in order to call this function to mark a given region of memory as fully read, write, execute. Um, so kind of going full circle, if an adversary has control of the stack but can't execute code from there, they can just mark the entire region of memory as executable and readable and writable and eventually call their malicious code. Um, but with this, this insinuates an adversary has a reliable way in order to gather those pointers to existing code and they have a primitive to reuse. Um, so, knowing that, that if an adversary has to have a way to read those, what if we just randomize some of these memory addresses in order to make the process of gaining these pointers um, either hard or impossible? Um, and that's exactly where address space layout randomization, or ASLR, comes in. Uh, so in the keynote, this was mentioned there as well. Um, basically, Windows, um, on a per boot basis, will randomize many of the um, structures and the images and uh, other items um, on Windows. So here, for an example, um, on the top image, you can see that kernel 32 is, lo is um, loaded at the start address, and when the system's rebooted, that address changes. And this is both supported in kernel mode and user mode as well. So, as we mentioned, in order to bypass DEP, you need some primitive to gather those existing instructions. But with ASLR in play, uh, an adversary now needs some sort of primitive in order to leak those addresses um, and use them. Um, and because of that, you basically need two separate vulnerabilities. You need a vulnerability to write or corrupt some memory, and you need a vulnerability in order to leak some memory um, as well. Uh, so, knowing this, this makes an adversary's life much harder just with these two mitigations enabled. And this is going to be a recurring theme here um, about the level of effort with exploitation today. So with that, um, there are many different vulnerability classes. We've been talking about stack-based um, vulnerability classes thus far. But one of the most popular ways to execute code is by overriding what's known as a function pointer. Um, so, building off of that, if we take a look at the code on the left-hand side, it may be hard to see. Um, basically, you have a function which just does a print statement, um, and basically a pointer to this function is created. And so, at the assembly level, if we look at that on the right-hand side, we see the call doesn't happen directly to the function, but it happens um, via its function pointer. So, with this, from an adversarial perspective, um, the program doesn't necessarily care about what's on the other side of that pointer. Um, this is known as an indirect function call. So, essentially, when this gets called, it will call whatever address it's, it's pointing to, which is this print statement. Well, what if an adversary could overwrite this pointer with some other sort of malicious address or um, 
uh, allocation of memory, etc., um, that would be pretty bad because the program would just end up calling that function. So with that, there are two mitigations um, today that Microsoft has implemented for this exact um, scenario. Uh, the first is Control Flow Guard, or CFG. We'll kind of talk about that first. This is uh, Microsoft's implementation of Control Flow Integrity. So ensuring that when an indirect function call happens, such as the one we've just seen, um, it's calling to uh, a actual target and not something malicious. Um, and so what CFG does, it basically inspects these indirect function calls um, to validate basically if the function, the in-scope function, um, to make sure that hasn't been overwritten basically with a nefarious address as we just spoke about earlier. So the way this is actually implemented is there is a bitmap that's generated at compile time um, that basically creates a list of all of the functions used in indirect function calls. And these are known as the valid targets. And so when a indirect function call happens, uh, what happens is the dispatch function for CFG will check that bitmap to say, hey, is this function we're about to call within that bitmap? And if it isn't, a crash ensues um, to protect the program or user from some sort of nefarious action. This is gr a great start, but the issue is that Windows applications natively import kernel 32 and NTDLL. And so these are also a part of that allow list. So an adversary won't be able to call to um, you know, a recently allocated region of memory, which they may have just generated with some malicious data in it, but they could craft function calls um, to other functions within kernel 32 or NTDLL or any of those valid targets. And so although you've lessened the scope of what an adversary can make a call to, it's still possible to overwrite a function pointer and call to something else. Um, but the great thing is that Microsoft has addressed this, um, and so we'll talk about it coming up here right in the next second, um, extended uh, flow guard or XFG, which kind of builds upon those principles we just spoke of. So XFG is more fine-grained um, control flow integrity. Um, so basically, it still uses a lot of the same principles as we just talked about with the bitmap. Um, but what it also does is it generates a hash, which is um, made up basically of the function's prototype. So whatever the return uh, type is, number of parameters, uh, type of parameters, and a few other things. Uh, and basically this hash is um, basically a signature that is representative of a function. It's unique to that function depending on how it's prototyped. And so that's used as an additional check before um, control flow transfer is placed to um, whatever is on the other side of that function pointer. Um, and so if you want to call a malicious function pointer by overriding, or if you want to call a malicious function by overriding a function pointer, it now not only needs to be in that bitmap that we just spoke of, but it need, the function you're calling needs to be prototyped the same way as the expected function. So we've gone from calling anything to calling a few less targets to calling even fewer targets. Um, so this does a, a really good job at protecting um, function, indirect function calls, and as we can see uh, in the assembly um, here, that in the R10 register, which is um, a box in red, that is the hash that's used as a check in this case. So we've started with the stack, and now we've moved on to um, primitives such as function pointer overwrites. Um, so these are all great things. Um, memory is randomized. Memory should either be um, executable in some cases or writable, but hopefully not both, um, as well as protecting uh, the control flow of programs. Um, but building off of this, there's even more modern mitigations, which this is what this talk hopes to address um, with mitigations maybe you may not be familiar with, um, such as arbitrary code guard, which we'll talk about here in a second, which builds upon these principles. So this is tailored toward browsers. Um, as we spoke about earlier, browsers are used a lot for initial access. Um, and it's Microsoft's instrumentation of write X or execute. Um, so as the name suggests, with ACG enabled, memory should either be writable or executable, but not both. And that is a strict enforcement of that. Um, so memory is immutable. So we know that there are data segments of memory and code segments of memory. This mitigation basically um, 
make sure that code pages don't become writable um, so an adversary can't write um, their user supplied uh, data to a code segment to execute it. And data pages cannot become code pages. So as we spoke about with DEP, um, although the data portion of memory is non-executable, we saw that we could craft a malicious function call in order to mark that region as executable so we can start executing code from there. Um, but with arbitrary code guard, it's not possible to do that. That data page cannot be turned into a code page to become executable. So now that primitive we talked about of executing native code by using return-oriented programming is not possible. Um, so let's talk about a little more about how that's manifested. So on Windows, um, in kernel mode, there is a structure known as the e-process structure. And basically this is the representation of a process. It contains its attributes, characteristics, etc. Um, and there's a member of that structure called mitigation flags. Um, and there's a bit mask. So if disable dynamic code is set, um, arbitrary code guard basically uh, will kick in if you're trying to um, call or change the permissions of memory. Um, and it's, in, it's checked through the function mi arbitrary code blocked. So this is a really good uh, mitigation, um, but the issue is it's tailored toward browsers. And so because of that, browsers, modern browsers, uh, use something called just-in-time compilation. And basically because JavaScript is interpreted, um, uh, it, it can induce some performance um, problems. And so if a piece of JavaScript is constantly getting called and called and called, the um, just-in-time engine will actually compile that into machine code and map it into what's known as the render process, uh, which is what you see with your browser. So by nature, just-in-time compilers are mapping read-write-execute memory into a browser. And so with Edge now being Chromium-based, um, there, there are a few issues here um, with that, but that's not to say Arbitrary Code Guard won't have full support in the future. That's not something that I can really speak to. Um, but this is something that is a known um, issue and something that is going to be taken into consideration in the future. And here's a, a blog from the Microsoft Edge um, folks basically outlining some of the issues that I've just spoken of and um, some, some great solutions uh, if you need uh, Arbitrary Code Guard in the browser. So now that we've talked about uh, user mode exploitation, um, as we mentioned, exploit chains consist of initial access uh, through the browser, and then you need some sort of exploit to break out of that browser sandbox um, in order to move around on a system, move laterally, et cetera. And so we'll talk about a kernel-specific exploit mitigation here. Um, so this infers that an adversary, um, first of all, I should say what it is, um, supervisor mode execution prevention. Um, this assumes an adversary has already existing access um, to a machine. And so that, that's a perfect, perfectly valid scenario for a uh, user using an initial access exploit and then trying to escalate privileges. Um, and so what will happen is if there's some kind of vulnerability within a driver that's loaded um, on Windows, um, what an adversary tries to do a lot of the time is find some type of function pointer um, to do what we spoke about earlier with control flow um, hijacking. And so they'll find that function pointer and they'll allocate some sort of shell code or data in user mode where they can control it because they can, that's where they're operating. And what they do is they try to overwrite that function pointer with the memory address of the data that they've just placed in user mode. And because that code is then going to be executed in context of the kernel, um, the shell code will get ran with administrative privilege, um, which can result in code execution as a system, uh, basically giving an adversary full um, admin privileges. And so this is exactly what SMEP uh, tries to mitigate. So basically, uh, from ring zero, uh, basically if you're trying to execute code from ring zero and you're reaching out to uh, ring three or user mode, um, page table entry basically, um, that you can't do that. Um, you can't just arbitrarily execute code in context of ring zero, which is the kernel, into uh, user mode or ring three. Um, so this is enforced through those page table entries we spoke of earlier. Um, so 
getting deeper into that, page table entries, as I mentioned earlier, are responsible for enforcing um, various properties or permissions of memory. So if we take a look at the um, screenshot here, on the furthest right-hand side, we can see um, it says PTE at, and then there's an address that's highlighted. If we look at the letters in the bottom right-hand corner of that screenshot, uh, we can see that there are a few um, uh, letters K, W, and V. This means this is a kernel mode page. Um, it's writable and it's valid. So what SMEP is actually doing at a bit of a lower level, if it, it's looking at that page table entry to see if that kernel mode bit is set. And if it is, we know that that's a kernel mode page and we can execute code from there. If it's a U or user mode um, bit, we don't want to execute code from there. Um, so these page table entries obviously are managed um, from kernel mode. Um, and building off of that, the base of the page table entries are randomized. So when I say base of the page table entries, basically this is an array um, that can be indexed. So the, uh, an array is a base offset mechanism. So the base of this array basically um, is randomized. Um, and as I mentioned, they're technically stored in an array. So if you wanted to locate a page table entry for a given memory page, um, basically you would divide the address that you would like to find the page table, the corresponding page table entry, by the size of a memory page, which on Windows is usually 0x1000. Um, you would then multiply this result by the size of a PTE, or a page table entry, which on a 64-bit system would be 8 bytes. And then you would add that base that we just spoke of um, in order to get the proper index into the array. Um, the thing is, where there's randomization, there needs to be some sort of way in order to find that base, um, since it's dynamic. Um, and so there are a few functions out there that have this, but one of the exported functions in the kernel is called mi-get-pte-address, um, which basically just programmatically does what we just spoke of. Um, so why am I speaking about all this? One of the ways an adversary uh, bypasses SMEP um, basically is allocating some shell code, as we uh, saw earlier in user mode. They will then use some kernel mode primitives in order to calculate the page table entry which corresponds to that memory address of their shell code. Um, and since it's a user mode page, they will corrupt that bit which we spoke of earlier that SMEP looks at in order to mark the page as a kernel mode page. So even though the user mode address um, is there and it's not a kernel mode address, the memory manager still recognizes that as a kernel mode page. Um, but one thing you have to take into consideration, and one, it's actually another mitigation, is page table randomization, is if you want to do that, to index that array, you need some sort of other primitive in order to read um, that uh, base of the page table entries. Um, so I kind of gave some context, hopefully, to um, some of the exploit mitigations that are out there. And so now I kind of wanted to use a case study and a recent exploit to kind of put that to the test and hopefully um, get away from a lot of these acronyms and jargon. Um, so this CVE here basically uh, is an exploit in um, Dell's BIOS kernel mode driver. Um, and this vulnerability is a classic write what where vulnerability. Um, so an adversary has a way to write arbitrary contents from user mode into the kernel um, in a controlled manner. You can control where that's going to go. So this is great from an attacking perspective. Um, I should mention as well, uh, you can arbitrarily read memory as well. So you have a read primitive and you have a write primitive. So we can leak sensitive contents, we can write into sensitive contents. Um, and so with this, this is the, the goal for an adversary. Um, so there are multiple avenues for exploitation here. Um, and so one, one of the things I wanted to outline is um, we spoke a lot about dev and page table entries. Um, let's use that um, with this exploit in order to um, bypass those controls. Um, so the first question we need to ask ourselves is, we know we can write some data into the kernel, and that means we probably will have some primitive to execute. Um, so, first question, what do we want to execute? Um, so, most adversaries, when you're executing native code in the kernel for an exploit, uh, you want to elevate your privileges to that of the administrator. So, um, I spoke of the eProcess object earlier on Windows, which uh, manages a lot of the properties for a given process. And this structure has 
a member known as the token, which basically is responsible for enforcing the privileges of a given process. Uh, and so what we want our payload to do is copy that um, token from a process that is already privileged, um, which is the system process on Windows, which has administrative privilege uh, and executes a lot of kernel mode threads. Um, and we want to copy that to um, our unprivileged um, exploiting process, essentially. Um, and when we do this, it will escalate our process to administrative privilege. Uh, I only included this slide because I intend on distributing it afterwards, so if you want to take a look more into the actual assembly that's behind it, um, feel free to. But basically what this does is it parses the eProcess object and it loops to find that system process, locates the token, and copies that token to the exploited process, which is unprivileged. So now that we know what we want to execute and what it does, uh, we then can use an arbitrary write primitive in order to write that payload to kernel mode memory. Um, so in this case, I targeted the drivers.data section. So as we spoke of earlier, depth places boundaries around code and data segments in memory. So a data segment, although you cannot execute code from there, you can still write the contents um, of your code to that segment. Uh, and we prove this through the page table entry um, of this uh, given page, which says it's a kernel mode page and it's writable. Uh, and so the goal now, once we um, are able to write our code to the um, data page, basically what we need to do is um, place all of the things we spoke about earlier to bypass um, a few controls into play. Uh, so basically what we start out with is using the read primitive in order to locate the base of the page table entry array as we see in the uh, screenshot on the furthest left hand side. Um, and then in step two, uh, in the top right hand of the screenshots, we calculate the page table entry that corresponds um, to the shell code that we just wrote. Um, and we can use those same calculations that that exported function mi get pt address does. And then in the screenshot right below that, we can see that once we've put all that together, we were able to obtain the base of the page table entry through the read primitive, and then we were able to successfully calculate um, the page table entry that corresponds to the um, code we want to execute. Uh, and we can just verify that through the last screenshot there. And then once we do this, we want to corrupt that page table entry um, in order to mark that page as executable because right now it's just readable and writable. We want to execute the code from there. And so we can use bitwise and in order to clear that bit, um, as we can see in the screenshot here. And in the bottom uh, right, we can see that after corrupting uh, the page table entry, this page is now kernel mode, writable, and executable. Um, that's great, but now we need some way to force the system to execute our code. So we have fully read, write, execute code in the kernel, but we need to execute it somehow. Um, one of the most classic techniques that is used um, to do this is performing control flow hijacking um, to overwrite a function pointer in um, the HAL dispatch table, the hardware abstraction layer um, on Windows. Um, so we kind of spoke about this earlier with corrupting function pointers. This is a, 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 um, something an adversary likes to do because it can result in arbitrary code execution through an indirect function call. So basically we use the write primitive to overwrite the function pointer at HAL dispatch table plus 0x8. And I know what you're thinking, why such a random address? Well, we'll talk about it in this screenshot uh, or in this uh, code here. Basically, there's a user mode function called NT query interval profile, um, which basically will perform a transition into kernel mode, um, and, or, and it will actually call that um, function pointer from the dispatch table. Uh, this is not any security vulnerability um, or anything. In fact, a lot of functions on Windows do this. You have a user mode function that needs to allocate some resource or do something, and it uses um, system calls basically on Windows that transition to kernel mode to do that. So for those who are, who are familiar with system calls on Linux, that's not just specific to Linux, it, it does exist um, on Windows as well. Um, so now we'll give a quick demo. Uh, since it's my first talk at B-Sides, I'm not confident enough to do a live demo. Um, but here's kind of why this is attractive, is we do a who am I, and we're an unprivileged user. We put everything together and then we have system privileges.
Um, so although this is kind of an arduous process to put all of these pieces together, um, it's just point and shoot at that point, and you have code execution in context of the kernel. So just to summarize, um, this exploit we just have shown relies on two things. Um, we hijacked the control flow of the system, and we also corrupted a page table entry in order to mark the page as fully read, write, execute where our shell code was in order to execute it. Uh, and so these steps are common with um, most remote kernel exploits as well. So I won't go into a full demo here, but um, one of my peers and friends, uh, Chompy1337 on Twitter, um, she wrote a proof of concept for a recent um, SMB um, exploit called uh, SMB Ghost. And this is a remote kernel exploit in the SMB protocol, uh, basically through a what's known as a pool overflow um, vulnerability class, resulted in a read-write primitive. And she did the exact same thing. She found some structure in Windows called K-User Shared Data, which is targeted by um, adversaries at some points um, because it has a static address, address in context of NTOS kernel, which is the Windows kernel, uh, the traditional Windows kernel. And it contains a code cave that's writable. So just like we did with our exploit, we found some kind of memory region we could reliably find. We um, were able to write the contents of our shell code there. And so looking at her exploit, um, it does the same thing. So she locates K user shared data, the corresponding page table entry, and corrupts a page table entry to mark it as read, write, and execute. And this is one of those exploits where the SMB protocol is handled in a kernel. Um, so if when we talk about, you know, the, the, the big thing now is ransomware and whatnot. Um, if you're deploying ransomware to one single system where you want admin privileges over a system, this would be the exploit you would do it with. It's remote, it's unauthenticated, and it's kernel code execution. Um, but thankfully, these exact scenarios are where two mitigations, if for nothing else, I view these as some of the most important mitigations to date, um, where they come into play are known as virtualization-based security, VBS, and hypervisor-protected code integrity. Um, so getting into those, this kind of brings us into the last portion of the talk um, about the practicality and future binary exploitation. Um, because we have a lot of these traditional mitigations thus far, um, which were pretty novel at the time, but these are a whole new level of complexity um, and do a lot of great things. And as we can see in the subtitle, a never-ending cat and mouse game is exploit development. Um, so virtualization-based security, we'll talk about what that is. Um, it's available on compatible hardware after this version of Windows, uh, and it can be enabled by default um, after 20H1 with proper hardware. Um, and on Windows 11, it's enabled by default. Um, and so basically, with this um, enabled, uh, the system runs on top of the Hyper-V hypervisor, essentially. Um, but more often than not, uh, many people in this room, if you may have not even heard of this mitigation um, before, it's, it's quite new. Um, it may be disabled in most organizations um, because there are a lot of things you need to make sure that are um, compatible with it. And we'll go through a checklist here at the end. Um, but it's extremely powerful, again, when it comes to the approach that vulnerability researchers um, are going to take with exploitation in the future. Um, so there's a great book out there. It's called uh, Windows Internals. You may be familiar with it. Um, I don't know if this is something you would read cover to cover, um, but it's a great reference, and they kind of speak about um, virtualization-based security and the basic architecture of it. I highly recommend you check it out. So VBS, what does it do? Um, so basically, we create another security boundary through what's known as virtual trust levels. Um, and so virtual trust level zero essentially is your traditional resources, your traditional user mode and kernel mode, which we just exploited here recently. Um, in the talk. And then you have VTL1, or Virtual Trust Level 1, uh, which is the secure kernel. Um, and we'll kind of get a little bit deeper into this. And so basically this, this boundary, this instrumentation of virtual trust levels prevents resources from one virtual trust level from accessing resources in another. So even the most privileged code that runs in the traditional uh, Windows kernel that code cannot make changes even to the user mode in virtual trust level one. 
Um, and what's great is that um, with the complexity added, you get a lot of great fe uh, features. So um, in kernel mode uh, in VTO1, um, that actually manages a lot of the sensitive resources of virtual trust level zero, such as the page table entries we just spoke about. Um, and the reason for this is, is because VTO1 is a more trusted security boundary. Um, and this right here is the basis for hypervisor protected code integrity, uh, which requires VBS to be enabled in order to run. Um, so this is my favorite part about uh, VBS, hypervisor protected code integrity, and this is basically arbitrary code guard um, in the kernel. Um, and so it enforces these things called enhanced page tables, or EPTs. And what this is basically is it's an immutable bit that's placed on um, tr the traditional kernel's page table entry, so in VTL0, uh, the kernel that we just sh shown for exploitation. Um, and so what that actually does is it enforces VTL1, which is the secure boundary, it enforces its view of the memory. And so if we remember what arbitrary code guard is, um, it's write, XOR, execute. So there's not going to be any regions of memory that are writable and executable at the same time. And so even with a primitive, as we've just shown, in kernel mode, in VTL0, where uh, the user was operating for our exploit, if you try to do page table entry corruption, it will actually not blue screen to death, but the thing is, um, VTL1's view of the memory is enforced. So even though VTL0 sees that as, you know, oh, we've marked this page as read, write, execute, it will not actually be read, write, execute. Um, and this means our page table entry corruption um, primitives that we show should fail. And then the second added benefit of HVCI being enabled, um, you may have recalled earlier with the um, function pointer override from our kernel exploit, why wasn't control flow guard there in order to protect that? Well, with HVCI, you have full enforcement of kernel mode um, control flow guard. So taking a step back from a second, from a higher level, if you have a CFG bitmap, which is used um, to contain all of the valid function calls that you can make, if that's in kernel mode, and a user has a primitive to corrupt some code in kernel mode, an adversary could just mark the whole bitmap and place everything as a valid call target and call to any function. Um, so with kernel control flow guard, you need, a tr you need a higher boundary in order to prevent that, and that's exactly what VBS and HVCI are there for. Um, basically, the KCFG bitmap is now protected by this mitigation. Um, and so you have full enforcement of control flow integrity within the kernel with these mitigations enabled. Um, and so this isn't on the slide, but um, even with um, or kernel control flow guard, um, if you don't have VBS and, uh, enabled, it's still, the, the routines are still there and it actually performs um, a few bitwise tests to make sure that there's not a user mode address being called, kind of what we spoke about earlier with SNAP. Um, but for full instrumentation of it, you, you need VBS and HVCI. And I would be doing a disservice if I just spoke about these mitigations and didn't show some ways to enable them. Uh, they can be done through the Windows Security app, also through GPO and the registry as well. Again, I would also be doing a disservice if I just said every situation enable HVCI. Um, there are a few things, obviously. If you have arbitrary code guard in the kernel through HVCI, essentially that's what it is. Um, you have writable memory or executable memory. So if you, you have a driver that's allocating read, write, execute memory natively, not through an exploit, that's probably not a good thing and you're probably not going to be able to enable that mitigation. So there is a checklist um, that Microsoft has put out. These are a few things on there. I've included the link in the slides, um, and so you can definitely check those out. Um, so nearing the end, most exploitation ends with some cool, or exploitation talk ends with like a cool novel exploit um, that bypasses all these mitigations and uh, does do all these cool things. But I actually wanted to end today's talk by showing how enabling those mitigations can um, thwart some of those power, even the most powerful exploit primitives that we've shown here with kernel mode code execution. So another demo, memory integrity is what HVCI uh, is called on Windows, and when we rerun our exploit, um, the machine blue screens. Um, so it protects the system from executing any um, uh, malicious code. And so the bug check that was actually here was the kernel security check failure. That was the reason for the crash.
And this was basically kernel control flow guard protecting the system against our control flow hijacking because HPC and I, excuse me, HPCI is enabled, meaning kernel control flow guard is completely enabled. And as I mentioned earlier, corrupting the PTEs won't necessarily cause a bug check um, in context of VTL0, um, but it's prevented in any case. Um, it's, it's not possible with, um, in terms of the primitives we've shown here um, to corrupt the page table entries of NTOS kernel um, when HVCI is in it. So if I could just summarize everything up with this talk, if it's something that you didn't find useful, if I could just summarize everything here of why I think you should find this useful, is exploit mitigations do a lot behind the scenes. So all of these things, um, a lot of them are enabled by default on Windows operating systems and you may not even know um, they're there and they're doing a lot for you behind the scenes. Um, some of the most powerful mitigations like we've shown, HVCI and VBS, they may not be enabled by default on your system. So definitely turn those on if you can uh, because they're fantastic. Um, there are also many other mitigations. I cannot stress that enough. This is not everything that uh, exploit developers, vulnerability research have to deal with. Um, one of the ones that I wanted to at least speak on slightly um, is Intel Control Flow Enforcement Technology, or CET. Um, with ROP earlier, we were reusing code um, in order to um, maliciously craft function calls. And with ROP, um, at a more technical level, why adversaries want to control the stack with ROP is return-oriented infers each instruction ends with the return instruction. What return actually does is it takes the stack pointer and loads it into the instruction pointer for execution. So every time you execute a ROP gadget, it will go back to the stack, pick up the next gadget, execute it, and that's the mechanism it uses to keep executing from the uh, stack. Well, um, CET basically thwarts ROP. Um, it creates what's known as a shadow stack, and it inspects the uh, stack's integrity, essentially, to make sure that there isn't any stack corruption going on, which kills ROP, which greatly raises the bar for exploitation. We also have MemGC, which is browser-specific, app container, code integrity guard, which is another great one paired with arbitrary code guard. Um, you have hyperguard, isolated heap, um, kernel patch protection, and many others as well. And so by enabling these mitigations when possible and just rolling, um, uh, as I mentioned earlier, uh, control flow guard is a compile time control. So rolling stuff like that where applicable into the software develop development lifecycle is going to greatly significant, going to significantly reduce the attack service and just break many of the public exploits that are available today. Uh, and with that, there are some QR codes for giving feedback on either my talk, uh, the conference, or anything else. Um, but with that, that's the end. So if anybody has any questions, I'm more than happy to try to address those. But um, thank you for having me.